Great. And there's no crackling. Well done, you. Thank uh, David Bowles. He's our technical advisor. I, I, I was the problem. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right. I guess uh, Libby and um, Toby are going to join us. Uh, Catherine, I want you to meet everybody. Uh, Catherine, we have uh, next to you is Dr. Donna Devine, um, who lives in uh, she's lives in Connecticut and New York City. Um, Gail, Gail Siegel is Hi. in Jerusalem. David and Kathy Bowles are in Australia. Jane is in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and when uh, the other two join us, uh, we'll, they'll introduce themselves. Um, Catherine, welcome. We're so happy to have Hi. you here. Thank you very uh, much. Um, I, I think all of us have been storing up questions um, for a, a long time. I think probably since season one. Uh, ah. We were able... <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> help me. <laughs> we were, we were uh, able to uh, get a lot out of Bevan, but um, you're here now and uh, you can give us a whole new perspective on certainly the last two um, seasons. Fine. Um, yeah. um, I want to start... And um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about process. Um, how does it work? Uh, you have script writers, there's you, there's Bevan. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how it all works? Okay, well, last year um, it was a little different. Do you want me to start with season four? Yeah, because that's when you came, right? Okay. Yeah, I wrote, I, I wrote, um, I was with Susan Bauer in season three. I wrote episode... Um, I think it might have been episode three or four, the um, abortion story when Sarah goes to the city, and another episode later in in that in series three, and that was a a group of um, uh, that was when Bevan wasn't involved, right? So that was quite a different setup. A group of freelance writers. We were all, you know, on top of each other's work and so on. And that was the first year when it had gone to Foxtel. Um, and that year, that was the year I, I came in around July um, into rehearsals. There was deemed a, a need for a writer to be in rehearsals and and because and, Susan and I had talked a lot about acting um, and so I, I, I became that person. So out of that, they then invited me to be script producer the following year with Bevan. Now, that was a pretty unique situation because that was Bevan for series four he was to write nine and I was to write three and I was to also be script producer um, in-house. And uh, so that was pretty much, um, we met, we, uh, I was very, very, very impressed by him. And uh, so, um, yeah, we just began to develop a relationship and a shorthand and um, his scripts would come in and... Um, we would discuss them and then we would get together. My, my, my episodes were later in the series. I think episode eight was my first one, eight, nine, and then 11. And um, what was Bevan eight? and I would get together and which, pot Which those. episode was eight? That's a good question, isn't it? I know, I know. Uh, it was because <laughs> I'm in the middle of five, series five now. So uh, it was the episode where Jack finally has enough and uh, confronts Sir Richard and... Um, and they plan to um, knock him to kingdom come. Remember the fight, the mm -hmm. big fight scene. Oh yes. So, do you now? You know, I've written soap opera before, and we, you know, have a bible, and then it's broken down to scenes, and somebody writes dialogue. How does it, how, do, how do you write the whole uh, uh, episode? Um, does Bevan give you the storyline? Can you give us a little more? Uh, sure, uh, sure. So, so for me, let, let's say he, you know, obviously he's doing his own own thing. No, so so for um, Bevan and I working together, it's pretty much what you would expect. I, I know soap operas are a little bit different um, uh, because you know they, they're doing many more episodes a week for starters. Um, this would be almost. Um, Anyway, you, know, you almost think of this as, as a sort of extended miniseries in some ways. Um, so, uh, so Bevan and I got together and 
and we discussed um, what he his ideas. Look, you know, you know, it's his show. He has great story ideas, and uh, obviously he's got you know he's he's got all of the storylines in his head. And uh, but you know, very very open to other people's suggestions. And um, so I think we spent the day talking about that. Um, in what we do, uh, I think we did um i did a, a just a, a probably a, a dot point synopsis of, of all the scenes um that really no one else was going to look at it was really for me and and for bevan and then just i launched straight into first draft so but again when you say straight into first draft that's a lot of structuring that's a lot of you know, you're often saying, okay, where are our first commercial breaks? Where's the second commercial break? Because that will give you the impetus. But even before you're doing that, you really, I think what you normally do when you're plotting something like this, and, and Bevan and I would have worked this way, is you just take the characters. What's, what's Sarah and George's story this episode? What's Elizabeth's story? What's what's Carolyn doing? What's Jack doing? What's, um, you know, Olivia and, and James uh, doing? How, how do they... How, how do they go on a, a journey where, you know, we're, we're fearful for them, we hope something will happen, we fear it won't or we fear it will. So, um, yeah, that's that, that's the process. And then I would deliver the first draft and uh, and still, still do. And um, usually, uh, well, right now it's just Bevan, myself and Chris Martin-Jones, the producer, and we go over that and... Um, we're usually plotting in blocks, so um, a block is episode one and two, three and four, and so on. Um, and so often, for instance, say if I was doing episode eight, but Bevan hadn't yet written episode seven last year, um, obviously there'd be stuff in my episode eight that, that needed adjusting once he delivered his first draft. So it's very much a to and fro process. Um, and of course, then you're going on to the third draft, and then many, many amendments as the script continues through the process. Are there? Are you on set? Is are the? Is it like um, film, or where there's there are constant changes? Uh, yes, uh, and it's probably in television. It's probably um, more likely um, that the writer is is nearby. Uh, in the states, of course, you have showrunners where the writers are really, you know, totally producing. So I suppose um, my job is as close as we get to that in Australia. Chris Martin Jones is executive producer. You know, is, is producing the directors and, and budgets and, and all of that. I, I don't do that stuff. But um, the set is downstairs. So my office, um, there's my office. There's um, next door to me is the art department. And so it's a great thrill if I'm writing or writing scenes to rush in and say, could we have a little toy that would make baby Georgie smile um, when Elizabeth says goodbye so they don't have to talk? And, you know, um, the wonderful Fiona will say, yes, I'll do a, um, you know, I'll make a little finger puppet or something, you know. So the art department's there. The, the studio is downstairs. So, and the uh, rehearsal rooms are just across a very large room, um, uh, an office. So um, depending on the director, I will be in rehearsal all the time. Um, some directors are happy, they, they'd like me there right from the beginning. Otherwise, I'm on kind of um, uh, um, emergency call, if you like. So if the act, their actors are rehearsing, they hit a stumbling block, they're not sure. Um, uh, I'll dash over. So I always have to keep those scenes in my head. I try to memorize those scenes so I can run into the rehearsal and know, you know, and pick up pretty quickly what they're up to. Does that answer your question? Uh, I think it, uh, does anybody have any other questions about I think you've given uh, us a pretty good idea, Donna? Yeah, as a, uh, I do. Oh, go ahead, no, Jane. Jane. Sorry, Jane. Jane. As a follow up, what is a script producer? Your list well, is producer. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, so I'm I'm responsible for um, getting the scripts out. Um, so making sure, say in series five, that the other writers uh, that we're plotting together. Um, in my case, um, sometimes a script producer would be also creating the story. 
you know, okay. the, the, the whole series. I'm not doing that because I'm, I've already worked with Bevan and I have an idea of where he, well, very strong idea of where he wants to go with each episode. We, he and I together alone have plotted those things out. So then I'm conveying that to the writers. I'm on call to the writers as they start to develop their synopses, um, as they're uncertain about, you know, where characters have gone in previous series or and then I'm also trying if they're new to the show which um, that that they can be trying to impart um, the the tone um, that, that Bevan wants and that the, the series requires then as we get closer as we get through first draft second draft in the meetings with the writers and the executive producers from the network and from Foxtel um, helping um, or just coordinating those meetings, making sure that the writers go away feeling comfortable, knowing where they need to go next. Um, then once the director comes, then there's a, a director's meeting. I'm part of that. I will have met and talked to the director about the episode, um, any challenges they have, any ideas they have to make, you know, that, that we, we can facilitate. And uh, then um, produce it continuing to produce a script through the read-through with the actors around a big table, um, actors, publicity, representatives of the networks, all those people, and the read-through. Now, those of you who are dramatists know often, you know, it's not until the words are in the air that that you suddenly go, oh, I've overwritten that, or that doesn't make sense. So, and, and so then, of course, we'll have a big meeting again with the writer and myself, and we'll look again at what we, what we can do. And so then probably as we go into production, there might be, you know, another 10 sets of amendments over time, not of every page, but of various, various scenes in the script. And I'm making sure that, um, that they go out on time and yeah so that's kind of the the journey yeah because yeah. when i was looking through the credits there's the writer the script producer the script the script consultant the script assistant yeah <laughs> yeah script yeah well the script assistant is probably my assistant who's wonderful and uh terence mccarthy or maybe he's script coordinator so he he he's yeah. the one who makes sure that all the right additions of everything are out that everyone has the right pages the right amendments because you go through all different colors they call you know different like you go through the blue amendments then the green then the yellow then the pink and so on and so on then the golden rod and you know you're starting to dig through that rainbow and um so he he's a another genius because he remembers everything he's been on the series since series one wow so you can, yeah you can say to him does so and so have a whatever and he'll go oh yes yes they have one of those or yes he's got a he's got a much better memory than i have well, we, we, <laughs> I you know, do the, obsessive without, with fans, the, the obsessive fans on the fan club page have found a few inconsistencies here I and believe. there so we're going to blame I, it all on terence no, we do them deliberately just to keep people on their toes. <laughs> uh, um, Catherine, um, Bevan tells me that uh, he just finished episode 10. We know that you don't go into production till February. When he says he's done with episode 10, exactly what does he mean? And it goes from him next to you. Uh, what's the... What's the actual process? Yeah. Yeah. So, um... I'd have to look at my schedule here, but um, yeah, he, he, he's written episode 10 and um, what we would call a first draft, which um, for Bevan, you know, is probably a, the equivalent of a fourth draft because he's such a good writer, um, but it's called a first draft. So, so we will meet with um, the other writer in the block of, who's written now episode nine and we'll get together and we'll, we'll massage those two and... Um, they will go away and rewrite, you know, rewrite them and um, come back with another draft uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. And, um, and always, you know, we'll be keeping an eye on how, how the show is panning out in the earlier episodes as well. So that really won't shoot until, and that will, that will continue on. It sounds like there's a lot of time, but suddenly. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Hi, Libby. So, uh, <clears throat> Libby? Yes, I'm here. 
Oh, so we're in, we've started the conversation already. Um, uh, tell uh, Catherine uh, where you are. I'm in Chicago. Uh, Hello. I love yeah, I'm going to try uh, to turn the video on. There we go. Okay, let me get some light here. And here we are. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Libby, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, process. Catherine is telling us... Uh, uh, how how it goes, where she, Devin starts, and and how it gets down, filters down. So uh, you, I'm sure you'll catch up. Okay, go ahead, so back, Yeah, back to Bevan's episode. So, so um, then, look, last year, um, you know, there came a point where Bevan just said at, at times, "I trust you. You, you know, you you do what you need to do now. You know, to, to get it up to speed." Other script, uh, but I'm always is on the phone to him and, and checking that, um, um, you know, the change, you know, making him aware of any changes that I have to make as we go along. Yeah, but in, in, in his, but when he says I've done episode 10, it really means what we would say, breaking the back of that story and leading us on, you know, putting us in a really good place, I, I, I have no doubt, for episodes 11 and 12 of series 5, which we are yet to, we are yet to plot. We're going to be doing that the week after next. Uh, before I turn it to, uh, on to somebody else, I, I, um, I noticed in the credit roll um, that there are, seem to be a lot of women, more women than I'm used to seeing on um, a lot of series here in the United States, um, particularly women directors. Um, do you, is there kind of a, I don't want to say feminine feel, but do you feel that um, because there's so much, uh, so many women with so much input that it's had an impact on the story? Look, to start with the directors, um, I asked about this the other day, we were talking about how there's a, a fairly good gender balance and, and the same is not always said of, of television. Uh, and um, Chris Martin-Jones, who, who is a wonderful producer and, and that's his role, is to select the directors, uh, he, he said he, he really doesn't consider gender. So we just happen to have a whole bunch of very good... We get the best directors possible and, and um, they have been so actually we had for season four yeah we had um uh three women three men i think is that right yeah 50 50 50. uh excellent okay um donna um for those of you who don't know uh you know donna is one of uh the uh, she's a very very active uh participant in our our page and um her area of expertise she's a professor of middle eastern studies so um she's interested in all aspects but she's really our expert when it comes to the portrayal of the jewish experience on um on the series and uh we've talked a lot about the authenticity of uh, of the portrayal and uh i mean, i know donna has a lot of uh a lot of insight and a lot of questions. So Donna, the floor is yours. When, uh, uh, to, to, to be fair about the Jewish experience, no one has real insight, our total insight on the Jewish experience, but uh, <laughs> I, have, I have a simple question and more complex question. So the simple question for many of us watching um, uh, the birth of uh, Sarah's son is why there was no circumcision or mention of a circumcision, a breed. Um, and particularly since uh, Sarah seemed to be conscious uh, before her child was, was out of the isolate, she seemed to be conscious that there was a legacy uh, that, he would, that would be imposed on him by the Blys. And certainly as a uh, Jewish male, there is a an expected legacy. So that's that's the uh, the simple question. Um, I'll 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 wait to ask the more complex one. Okay, you know it, it it is it becomes very interesting in drama that the I understand you can tie that into her, um, you know, her wanting the the child to to um, you. Know, you know, to, to be Nordman or, you know, fit, you know, with all of the, the business about the birth certificate. I think that probably would never have made it. If we if we had that focus, it probably 
wouldn't have made it um, into the through the edit. That's that's I think. So we we end with her getting the baby and the baby being the most gorgeous thing, and then we jump two weeks. So what happened in that two weeks? That's what we might find out. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, next uh, the next question is: uh, uh, You've uh, uncovered and and drawn into the drama uh, some incredibly uh, uh, sometimes esoteric customs. The breaking of the plates. I I have to say that uh, uh, I saw I've, I've seen that once in my life. Um, uh, actually, and I thought the mothers-in-law wanted to break the plates over their head, each other's heads as a sign of anger. Um, but uh, things like that, and then uh, uh, texts that Sarah will, uh, uh, and, and, and some of us have had to listen several times to get the Hebrew to know where where the prayer is coming from. Whereas in the, in the first... Uh, couple of seasons, there, 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 there's a focus on things that are much more familiar, uh, the Kaddish, uh, Yom Kippur, uh, even the mikvah, but but she's in, in one of the episodes repeating a prayer that you say uh, uh, in a, a prayer for memorial, um, remembering um, your lost ones or not not the Kaddish, a, a much more uh, esoteric one or uh, uh, some of the other things that uh, the, the uh, prayer for health for her, her baby. Uh, where do you get that? How do you, how do you decide that that's going to have dramatic appeal? Um, I think it, I mean, I mean I think that you know it has dramatic appeal because um, you know she she she's Jewish and she has uh, um, and it separates her from the Blies. I mean that's the you know that's the you know the drama of it as much as anything and, and George as well separates them. Um, look, um, my uh, I mean I'll use the plates as an example. I think Bevan wrote the plates, so I don't know where he got it from. So then um, there came this big discussion, which I can talk about now. Um, so I think I rang, I have um, Temple Emanuel here um, uh, that uh, is a synagogue in, in, in Sydney. Um, a friend of mine is a rabbi there and I, I, merciless, I, I exploit his name and get through to a very nice man who answered my questions for me. And right, probably two blocks from me is the Jewish Museum. So she's also very. Uh, the woman there is is also very good, and we have a, a a guy who helps Martin with the translations and so on, and he gives some advice. And you're right. There's three different versions of everything. Yes, we know. You know, there's always that. more than three. More than three. Three hundred. Um, so um, then, uh, so, so with those plates. So I rang my synagogue. The I'm saying my synagogue. I'm. I'm not Jewish, and uh, he he went. Oh, really? Oh, I don't think. Oh, let me ask someone. Oh, <laughs> it's a thing with mothers and mother-in-laws, and they get together. Now, I had written the um, the Mourners Kaddish episode in series three, and I thought I had cleverly, you know, got around her um, saying the Kaddish, even though she wouldn't. But by saying, you know, we've had an unconventional marriage, and therefore, yeah, it's yeah, no, that was wonderful. Is good. No, no, no. I was really proud of that little kind of sleight of hand. Um, that is and also, the best I was episode. Very, oh, thank you. Uh, and I was very, uh, I was very proud of um, of Chris Martin Jones. I remember because in a meeting, when and I, I remember saying to him, because someone previously had got a, um, a minion mixed up, and it doesn't matter. They hadn't sort of known the numbers or something. I said to Chris, it needs ten men now you know how expensive television production is, you know and i said uh and i i wasn't on you know i wasn't a script producer then just a writer i said could we have 10 men and he said yes of course we can and i never forget that because i just thought oh i love this show <laughs> you know you can so, so we were able to do that so with the plates again it was a little bit unconventional that sarah would bring it and um i know i remember the um art department kept coming in and saying i've done my research 
it do, it's not right. They wouldn't have them. And, you, you know, and we're looking up on the internet and, um, it, you know, this isn't, it, it's not going to happen. And so, but in the end, we all agreed that it was too beautiful to lose. So that's that sort of thinking. Does that help you? Yes. Yes. You know, I, I think that early, I think that, that there may have been a few moments in some of the earlier series where um, Sarah was a bit, um, Sephardic and not Ashkenazi, but <laughs> I think um, maybe. Her, but her Hebrew um, is getting better. It's getting better. Um, about the plates, just uh, as an, it, just as an aside, because uh, it's done. It's actually still done very much today, usually among Hasidim, and it's called Tanaim, and it is done by the mothers-in-law, and it's done. Uh, before the ceremony, uh, the men are all in a room and the women are, you know, they're, they're separate. And the marriage contract is brought both to the, to the groom and to the bride. And after the groom signs the, uh, the um, ketubah, the, the uh, marriage contract, that is, in fact, when the mothers-in-law break the plate. Now, there are several reasons they do that, but the easiest answer about that is the breaking of the plate is kind of like the breaking of the glass. And there are mm -hmm. several reasons that you do that, but it is about the fragility of life. And, uh, and, and um, in a lot of Hasidic families that I know, the plates are taken and the pieces are turned into pins and you will yes. find the proud mothers-in-law uh, <clears throat> wearing them. But even though it was done in an unconventional way that Sarah should bring Craig, you know, uh, Jack the plates, it was so, so beautiful. Um, it reinforced their relationship as close friends and really showed how much she wanted to um, express her, her love and respect. And I found it to be, while not 100% authentic, quite beautiful. And uh, all my uh, religious friends who've seen it were quite taken with it as well. Oh, that's good. As long as they don't stop watching and start discussing <laughs> whether we were <laughs> accurate or not, that would be terrible and miss the rest of the story. But, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, I mean, and that's, that's the challenge uh, that we all face in television, um, which is making sure that in the great rush, because once it's like a steam train, once it, once the director starts and then you've got you know a set time and from then on you're on the on the roll you you know you're, they're shooting they're they're away and um and time is important and scenes can be dropped and all of those things so you really always have to keep an eye on the uh the gems i suppose the things that under no circumstances where it'd be too strong to say that but but that you really do want to hold on to and that for instance would be one of those things yeah yeah it's um, more time is the enemy than you know we are all a good team we all work together for exactly the same end um and time is often the enemy time and the weather uh, um uh catherine uh libby uh i want you to uh, jump in um i just want to tell you and uh for the people here who don't know um libby is a very accomplished writer in her own right and i just finished reading um the first one of her books i have taken four of them out of the library in spite of the fact that i'm not a real mystery person uh her books are are quite wonderful um so uh libby uh uh, jump right in. Okay. Well, Catherine, it's it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, my first question is, um, what surprised you most about a character's development over the course of the series? What did you not expect that just happened because it was it it was natural and right? Yes, I, I, you, you know that feeling when you're writing, don't you? When you, you absolutely have, you know, for as much as we can structure 55 scenes of a television episode and we say in the room and we say in our synopsis we know what's going to happen, then there's the next point where you start to write and the characters hopefully have free will and they start right, exactly. to do things. Um, for... 
for me, I suppose right from um, uh, the very first time I worked on the show, and I think that's, you know, I, I'm a, that was in that series three, I'm um, calling it the abortion scene when, when Sarah goes to the city. I think it must have been episode four. Uh, the savagery of Aunt Peg, um, the absolute... Um, fury, blind, white-hot fury and personal fury of Aunt Peg, I remember going, you know, that moment, and I know you know it as a writer, where you start to go, oh, I can't do that, I mustn't. And then if you don't, um, the character will never, you know, the, the character will never forgive you, you know. Um, so so I, I do recall that. Um, uh, I have had a lot of moments as a writer and please, let's all remember it's Bevan's show, right? <laughs> I'm as a writer, I'm writing Bevan's, Bevan's story, and he's generous enough, and I'm smart enough to make it feel like it's my own, right? <laughs> but it's his. Um, but uh, and I do remember I've had great. Mo oh, I've had moments I've really enjoyed with um, Sir Richard, where. Ah. You know, he's got stuck in, you know, where, where I think the scene was he's just, he walks down the stairs with Douglas and, and my uncle was a prisoner of war and uh, and I just, and that moment when he turns around and I, again, one of those moments you go, oh, no, don't, don't do that. Don't say that. God, you're going to hurt so many people if you say that. You know, and when he talks about, oh, yeah, the men who couldn't, you know, right, they, they right. haven't survived the war. Well, it's eight years on or whatever it is. I think I got the years wrong and someone had to help me. Eight years on and um, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, you, know, you know, ghetto, you know, that you know, kind of thing. Um, um, and, and, I mean, all writing is uh, finding your own dark place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. You're finding your own prejudices, your own racism, your own your own capacity for greed and envy and love, hopefully. Um, one of the characters, I think the one that, that surprised me the most, and I, <clears throat> and I really wonder where you're going to take her in season five, is Livy. She's just... Um, she did things in season four that I would never have thought her capable of doing. An understanding, a maturity, um, an awareness of the strange circumstances she was in, but the love that was underwriting it for both her, James and James's happiness. I thought as a character, she was just marvelous this season. Oh, that's good. Yeah, Bevan had a very clear idea of where she was going. And, and obviously... Um, so Darianne would and uh, but but um, and that kind of journey what we I think we intended was the journey towards a sense of of internal strength yeah um, that really didn't come until in my mind and with this was a big discussion it came at that moment towards uh, I think in episode 11 which was mine or no it was Bevan's it must have been 12 where um, she says could I be held, please, in the hotel room after all of the brouhaha? Right, right, right. And th there was a big discussion around this, and um, and uh, I said that is a sign of, of great strength. That's actually her final point, where you can ask your vulnerable, you're strong enough to be vulnerable, I suppose. Absolutely. Is that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, that w I have to tell you that her scenes with James were the only things that brought tears to my eyes this season. Right. Yeah, because, tell me why. I think because it was so, she was handling her sorrow with such dignity and such warmth, and her whole life was falling apart, and yet she had something love. She had, she had a generous spirit. And she wasn't gonna. She was. She was still concerned with James and his happiness, as as sad as she was. Yes. Yeah. I think that that was certainly Bevan's Bevan's take. I think I um I was really glad that she did have that moment where she could run out of the house and run into the woods. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. You know. And um, I think we've all done that kind of thing where you want to just bash. I mean, I think I probably wrote she bashes her head against a tree, but it would have been a bit too much. Um, but you know, you all feel, feel like to her in season five. Can you give us any uh, hints? No. Of course. no. Um, I would be. Oh. Uh, someone would take me out into the woods and bash my head into a tree. 
And it would well, be I know the, something. I know something. Something, something who would do that. <laughs> I know something extraordinary is going to happen because she's just a terrific character. Yeah, no, she is. She, she's, she's gorgeous. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is worth sharing, but um, just going back to the you, you process that we started on and you, just while my head's in that scene, if you recall that scene, it was with Olivia. She she and Henry, who's been an absolute... Um, uh, um, bastard um you know realizes how he's been they go to look for james right he's been dreadful at the party and they end up in that hotel room and um now an example of um i got across to the hotel to the hotel, to the rehearsal room um and when Tim Draxel felt that he needed more after olivia asks that question can i be held and he felt he needed more and, and of course you know I always argue for the writing and I'm saying no 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 you've got enough you don't need you know you don't need more but then he, he made a very good case that he just needed more to express his love for James in that scene if it was just one line or two lines so again that's my role is to quickly come up with something that I think will, will serve that you know that, that um, that's just really think cool. where we began Sorry. I just had one other question how much um not improvisation, but how ma how much change goes on between the script and what the actors want to do once they've taken the character under their <clears throat> into their psyche. Look, um, the actors and the and the director the directors really encourage the actors to work within the text to find to find with, within the text so there has to be a fairly good case made and um, it will often be a phone call from location change one word to me um, but I would certainly uh, none of that can re really does happen um, without without a good, a good reason and often um, an actor you know could say no I have to have to change and then you explain they go oh, okay now I get it or or they'll ring back in 20 minutes off the set and go, oh, you're right, I forget what I did, you know? So, but, um, yeah, no, not, not very much at all. I have worked on a show like that where there was a lot of improvisation many years ago and <laughs> so much story that disappeared. Um, uh, I can't even begin to tell you, but it made me want to give up writing forever. So. <laughs> um, Catherine, but, um, I, I want to say that, um, first of all, the story of Olivia and James, I think we were all uh, uh, hooked on it from the very beginning. And it's so magnificent to see how um, both of them have grown as actors. Um, they seem to, they're presented with new challenges um, every uh, in every episode. And, uh, you know, they're kind of the younger ones and, you know, people like Noni and, you know, Frankie and, and Brett, you know, they're seasoned actors and we expect them to deliver great performances. Um, but the two of them uh, have been so just outstanding and um, are, are, we really love them. Now, I had been saying for a long time that I missed Harry and that we should they should bring him back. Why? Why did they, you know, why was that storyline uh, ended? And I, for one, was uh, delighted when he reappeared um, because I thought, you know, he would certainly add something to the story. But I think that Dominic Albert is a just a wonderful, wonderful actor uh, playing a, you know, a, a character that's evolving in, um, in a world that he doesn't really know and feels that he doesn't mm. belong in. And I think he's mm. just... I think he's just been extraordinary and I for one can't wait to see, um, you know, um, how that evolves. I, I'm going to let somebody else ask, uh, but I, I, I want to ask you one thing, um, just shifting gears, you know, um, the rape scene must have been incredibly, incredibly difficult um, to write. I know we have spoken to Sarah about what it was like to play it, but how is a scene like that written? 
Um, uh, uh, yeah, now I'm trying to think who wrote that. That was series three, wasn't it? Um, yes. I'm pretty sure it wasn't me, although I might have had some rewriting on that scene. Look, you know, I've... Uh, you write as a writer. You are required to write, or you want to write, um, as I said before, from your own darkness. And uh, um, there is a part of what I would say, you know, off, you know, occasionally I teach, not very often, but um, uh, you know, you you need, as I said before, you I I would want to find the part of me that um, could rape someone. There must be a part of me that could um, do that damage, or, or or could could lie to myself and think I I was doing something else. I mean, I'll give you a horrible example, and I don't want to give you nightmares. Um, but um, years ago, I wrote for a TV series called GP, which was rather terrific because you didn't have to include all the regular actors, so you could kind of write a play of the week, <laughs> and the regular actors kind of walk past in the background. But you know. Um, you could you could you could create this uh, one hour drama. Um, bit you know British. Uh, you have those sort of one hour dramas. Anyway, I wrote um, an episode about a father who got a girl pregnant, who got his daughter, you know, incest story, daughter pregnant, and then got a phone call sometime later saying we're wanting to write a story, a drama from about a pedophile from the pedophile's point of view. So, of course, I said, oh, thanks. for," And we thought of you was the other, you know. Yeah. The, uh, yes, okay, thank you very much. And so um, just two things. I mean, that's a, a show you're not interested in. But just in terms of being a writer, um, uh, I, you know, I got someone in who treats pedophiles and we sat and talked. Um, and so I read their diaries. I, I, try, I wanted to know in their head how they justify everything. And then... Um, and I'm not doing anything that any other writer wouldn't do, that Bevan wouldn't do it, you know. I mean, it's a normal writer's process. Uh, but um, there, I remember there was an observer in the room, a young woman who wanted to get into television, and she kept sighing and going, oh, no, oh, oh, as the psychiatrist was talking. And I, we, I had to ask her to leave because the psychiatrist, of course, was clamming up and not wanting to, you know, divulge what I needed to know. So does that answer the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. It does. It does. Um, uh, in over in the corner is uh, are David and Kathy Bowles. Uh, David, among other things, well, his biggest role um, is that he's our technical person, and he comes through for us for to record and to you know uh, uh, put it up on YouTube and to really uh, get the masses to to see it. But and his mother Kathy is right next to him, and they are Australian, and. I'm curious, you know, you're you're talking to Americans here, and it is an Australian drama, and I they've been watching. Uh, Kathy's been watching from the beginning, and she's also a very avid uh, viewer of all kinds of um, television. So, Kathy, you know, share with us um, a little bit of your insight, and you've got Catherine here to uh, to uh, to answer whatever uh, whatever has been on your mind for the last four years. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. We turn this off most of the time because of feedback, because we're recording. Okay. Um, you've really opened a can of worms there, Susan, because, um, as you know, I was not happy with season three. Um, it quite traumatised me. And probably Tell us why. Why? Why? Um, it seemed as though, and I know that... Um, Arian Wen, I think, has said this in one of her in her chat, I think, or somewhere that somewhere. that feedback uh, that um, she was hoping that something nice would happen to her character next season. So many things went wrong, made it wheat. When I watch programs, I identify with the characters, I feel it, I hate them, or I love them, or I like them. Um, and when too many things are too traumatic, I often say that's enough. Quite every now and then I say that's it, I'm not watching that anymore. When I found Bevan was coming back, I thought there's a ray of hope. 
we're going to have it's going to be because I don't know why but I've you know it's I'm still recovering from season three because it was a really big thing for me until then and um, just all those things I, I've particularly felt what happened to Car That's Carolyn not, too Carolyn that was too. really I thought no not our no. Carolyn that can't happen to her she's a real person you know and uh, so and those sort of so things um, yeah so yeah. I was happy and and the question I was going to ask it is a bit like is a bit re related to that um, you were talking about tone before we've been talking about this um, we think that it's it's slowed down the pace has slowed back down to the way it was before and I think that I think that's true I was going to ask you about um, I, I can imagine some of the things how do you um, make the tone change to the way you want it to be for example you've got something that's really fast paced and dramatic and melodramatic and then you have something where it's it's much more leisurely the way the show has always been yeah. until season three, season three unless I'm remembering wrongly right so um, it, it is interesting um, just on the you know say the question of just before get to tone of what happened to Carolyn um, it was traumatic and it was terrible and in real life it would take an awful long time to to work through. Um, in the world of television, I think we we are aware of exactly what you're saying and your kind of um, response, which is we can't expect the viewer to go through too much of that pain. That's what you mean, isn't it? Is would I be right? Yeah. Sorry, I can't quite see you. So yeah. So. Um, Oh, there you are. There you are. Great. Yes, I can see you now. Um, yeah. So um, the um, I think um, and and that you know so so we have to always strike that balance. I, I suppose um, the the journey for Olivia, I think, is um, she she does she does in series um, four go through. Yeah, a lot of ups and downs, but that is the nature of drama. That's how characters revealed, isn't it? Um, so now back to tone. I'm, I'm probably not very good at really recognizing the tone of series four was very much um, a a strong melodrama, obviously with Regina pushing pushing that that story through. Um, and that's deliberate. It was um, it's sort of the Douglas Sirk kind of um, uh, influence on Bevan's writing, and and a lot of the films of the nine, uh, 1953, 54, that period were of that that nature, of that tone. Um, so there is a decision, uh, probably each series, um, to follow to follow a particular tone, I guess. And we we don't think of, it's not at the forefront of your mind because story is at the forefront of your mind, but as um, other uh, as music comes in or or just way, ways of editing the story again you might touch back on that and go hang on is that the tone of our show now I don't know if I've done, really answered your question have I um, maybe I should have said can you hear me you should have yes. said pace I should have said pace perhaps because right. pace was back and more like it was before, I think, in season four. In series four? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, then there we are. Yeah, yeah I think that's what yeah. I have said. But basically yeah. that you, you know, one disaster after another sort of thing. Well, it's not one disaster. Yeah. 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 You know that... Yeah. 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 Probably there was more emotional... Um, Tension running through series four because of the that kind of um, strong drive of Regina, um, but um, yeah, yeah, I think they're very yeah they're very different. They're very different. Different script producer, different um, different writers, and um, I think that happens in you know a lot of shows. Yeah, yeah. But I'm Rich sorry if series three was uh, so. I'm sorry that you felt that, and I hope that you. We'll stay, stay with the show. 
Um, Regina is so awful. You know, you were talking about, you know, having to draw and, you know, imagine yourself, you know, as the character so that you, in order to write for them, please share with us what on earth about yourself could you get in touch with that uh, oh, you to have that this and get me started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, come on, wouldn't we all like to scare the hell out of people and <laughs> just by walking into a room? <laughs> you know, I mean, no, she's very, she's very disturbed. So of course, um, but what fun to write? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jane. Yeah. You you share so many opinions and so many insights. <laughs> when Catherine is not here, this is your big chance. You know, she spent a good amount of time with us. Let's let's uh, let's zero in on one more thing that you've been dying to know. Um, oh God, I, I had so many questions when we, when we chatted with the stars, I thought, oh God, can I think of a question with you? I had this tremendous list, oh, um, God. um, two things, uh, two, two lines. Did you write the actual lines after George's wedding? When Elizabeth says you do well to think of your wife as an obsessive 15 year old, did you come up with that? We love that. <laughs> I love it too. That was Susan Bauer in the plotting meeting. She oh, came okay. up with that, and um, and I I believe I I stole it immediately and put it into my script. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't always remember who I stole things from, but I do remember her. I remember her saying that, and I thought it was perfect. Yeah. And obviously, Susan, who worked with Bevan on All Saints, as you know, and you know, mm -hmm. and is a wonderful script producer. I, I believe she probably had someone else in mind at the, you know, when she's someone she knows, you know. Yes, we will. We we are like, um, you know, little yeah. scavengers. What if people say something, you know, we'll, we'll grab it in a plotting session. We often have someone taking notes verbatim, um, so that um, you can look back and go, oh, okay, you know, I said I came. Often you come out with a line. Uh, you know, and you're talking about a character, but if there's someone taking notes and you can go back and grab it. Yep. Okay. But keep going. And um, did you think of the string quartet? When Doug I did. Oh, good for you. Loved it. Picking something <laughs> I did. Um, I did. And that was a surprise. Again, when writing, you know, um, you know, it's like when Bevan wrote uh, Elizabeth um, talking to Sir Richard after the Prime Minister's dinner. When he wrote the first draft, he had no idea that she was going to pick up a knife. <laughs> you know. So again, that's a perfect example of. Um, I always say, you know, writers need the quiet moment. If you write, if you write a scene, you know, like if you write a synopsis to death, then you could easily blow that moment because you're already bored by it. You know, by the time you come to write it. So. Um, uh, yeah, so he had no idea, and she just picked up a knife. And again, probably he had that little break in his mind and went, um, "Oh my God, this is is this too much? Could it be too much?" Well, the answer to that's always no. You know, let's put it down and see what happens. You know, so I mean, there's a perfect example. Yes, I did do the string quartet, and I was very, quite proud of that. Thank you. But I didn't know that they'd find the money to do it. I have to say, I think at one point. You know, but you know, you're always looking at budget, and I was very pleased that they found the money. It must have been great fun for. It must have been great fun for Noni and Mark to work together like that because they're such wonderful actors, and to have that kind of material must have been fabulous. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hope so. Oh, yes, I think that. Yeah, they, they. I think uh, Mark laps laps that up very nicely. And Noni, I mean, they are all a pleasure to work with. Noni is wonderful. So you had some more questions, I think, and we. Well, were there other things that that you didn't get to that you wrote that you didn't get to put in, maybe because of budget constraints? Oh gosh. Um, you know, you forget about those, don't you, really? Okay. Um, uh, you know, I didn't think there were too many. I mean, there was a, there was a time, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil things too much, but, you know, like, like, you know, diving into that cool pond, the two boys in the middle of winter, you know, uh -huh. I mean, that's a really, that was a big challenge. Um, and, and I was certainly on hold to write an alternative. Um, uh -huh. Which I, 
absolutely couldn't think of to save my life that look as gorgeous as that would look, you know, or even Harry lying in the water, you know, and then turning over. I mean, it was freezing, freezing cold. And um, but anyway, I don't want to spoil the magic of all of that. But look, I can't th look. I'm sure there are there there are always scenes that you lose, you know, driving scenes, you know, that you'd like to have. Uh, uh, I think I had a long scene with George and Olivia driving along, and I'm talking about second or third draft. Um, and uh, Olivia was talking about growing up in London during the war and how the women, it was towards the end of series 12, uh, when they were speeding off to Sydney um, to find Jane, and uh, how the women in London had felt, always felt, uh, so, so the women in the country, you know, during the war, they'd felt useful, all had to go back to being wives again, and, and how she wanted to feel useful. And uh, it was just a scene, it was very lovely, but it really wasn't progressing the drama. And uh, I think I, I think I saved the dialogue of that for her to say at a party or something in the background. <laughs> so it didn't go to waste, you know, like when you're making a dress, you know, there's a bit of fabric left over and I grabbed it back again. But, um, uh, you know, uh, often you talk to novelists about this process that we as screenwriters go through and, you know, because that's how I want to write for television. And, um, um, Libby, I won't include you in this, but you know, they, they can be appalled because they go, Oh my god, all these people have a say, all these you're still changing things, you know, after the third draft, and then there's more amendments and more. How do you put up with all this interference? Well, of course, we choose that because we want that give and take process, you know. Actually, my background is in film. There you go. Well, you before know. I started to write novels, and one of the reasons I switched was because film was too collaborative. That's right. <laughs> and when I had an idea, when I once in a while I would actually have an idea and I wanted my idea. And yeah, now, that's right. of course, I wish I had more people to help me through. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know. You can't never have it both ways. I know. It's a shame. Now, yeah. do you have a writer's room? Is there a writer's room for the series or is it just you and Bevan? No, well, it was just me and Bevan last time, and now we have, uh, for Series 5, we have um, some writers, and, uh, yeah, we would, um, we, our writer's room would be the writers on the block. So, of mm. Episode 1 and 2, which happens to me, me and Be Bevan and myself, and then who's ever on the block, 3 and 4, 4 and 5, so, and me, yep. And I will have spoken to Bevan, um, you know, in the lead up and we would have talked about what we're going to talk about in that room. And then we would meet for a couple of days um, initially and then um, meet again and again and again and again. Yeah. But but the, the concept of the writer's room in is really, uh, look, it's, I think it's more relevant in comedy in the United States. You know, right. those big, uh, the big sitcoms where a lot of, where writers are often responsible for one character. Um, it, and also when the American model, which is very attractive, and I've, I've you know, sat in on these things, but, but where all the writers are on set, uh, sorry, all the writers are in studio. And so they may all get together and talk about um, one script um, and throw ideas around. But generally... Um, uh, what we will do is um, get together, you know, Bevan and I were together for a week or two before we began. So that's our little writer's room, yeah. So you have an arc for the entire season before you actually start writing each episode, correct? Correct. And when you say you, uh, it's really Bevan has the arc and I interpret it and, and um, throw it around and feed it, you know, feed it back to him. But it's, yeah, it's Be Bevan has that very strong concept of where it's all going. That is not my, um, this style of drama isn't necessarily my style and I just admire what he does so much. It's, uh, you know, he has a degree on, in pure thematic, you know. On that note, I, I want to ask, you know, uh, Bevan, we all just love him. All 1500 of us in our group, we just love him. Um, uh, as a writer, you know, myself, I know what why I'm drawn to him, but what is it about him um, 
that makes everything that he puts his hand to so spectacular. Um, he's able to capture, I, I've seen a few other things. I actually binge watched um, Pack to the Rafters. And when I mentioned it to him, he said that was a commercial success, meaning, you know, I don't know that it was, uh, you know, what he, that it was his perhaps favorite thing to do. What is it about him that is so special? Um, I think he is, he, you know, because I had to make, I, I, you know, we met for coffee and I'd never met him before. And so um, I had to make it, you know, I made the decision to work with him. And, and what I, I really got was that he is a writer's writer. He's, um, he, he is vulnerable. He's um, compassionate, uh, which means then that you also have an understanding of what an audience requires. I mean, there there is that. Uh, he's got a very very strong. Um, I won't say photographic memory, but but a, but a really strong base in in nineteenth century literature, the great the great nineteenth century novels. Um, and he's got this mathematical brain as well, which makes him great at structuring. But I would say ultimately, um, he is as vulnerable and as uncertain, despite his success, as all writers are, and, and in fact should be. Yep. Um, and so when he delivers episode 10, actually that reminds me, I feel bad because I haven't read it yet, um, but he'll be waiting to know what I thought of it, whether because he's got the vulnerability of a writer. So he's never lost that. And he's just, a, you know, he's got a great imagination. Uh, Catherine, um, he told me that working with you was the best professional relationship that he's had. He just adores you and just loves working with you. So... Uh, uh, pretty mutual. Um, I, I think it's pretty mutual. And... Uh, it we we've had it we had a few laughs about that along the way because i think the first day we sat in a room together on episode eight of series four that was the i remember and i said oh you know we're looking at the whiteboard and i because i like i like working at a whiteboard he's smart enough just to have it all in his head and um i said oh you know olivia needs something in here no 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 she doesn't he said no 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 no. this is just a small episode for olivia and i don't think he'd mind me telling this you know because everything else was perfect and brilliant and i said oh i think she might no no she doesn't that's not the nature of the show this is the first day we'd worked together and i just said oh well i'll just write it myself anyway because i'm writing the episode and um, and uh, there was a little moment and uh, and he 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 argued and argued against me and then came back and then said do you see what i do i often argue for something for a really long time and then i change my mind and i come back again and i just admired what that is something i really admire about him his self awareness is um is is uh is quite wonderful because you know all these meetings you yeah, know i think yeah. i hope i've described as, as much as everyone wants to be on track it's very easy to say like the plates thing if someone says oh they, they people don't do that yeah yeah let's cut it right really easy when you try and do it you know you've got the time so so um we all go into these um things um feel shaky and vulnerable and um and i think um um Bevan's no, no exception. Yeah. The, the um, other thing, when I first went into the meet, a meeting with all, all you know, as, in the role of script producer, and Bevan said very kindly, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to sit there because I really want you to feel ownership of this series four, and I want you to. And, you know, he meant it, and he really did. And we got into the meeting, and Bevan started talking <laughs> and talking. And, um, and you know, again, this, you know, we'd only been together, you know, hadn't been together very much. And afterwards, I came out and I just looked at him, and he says, "Yeah, I did, didn't I? I did just, I didn't do what I said, did I?" And I said, "No." And we had such a laugh about it, and we still do. So um, he doesn't take himself too seriously. He's self-aware. He's extremely passionate, and uh, and he's passionate about his work when he knows he's right, and. Um, and uh, that was what really attracted me, that he wasn't going to have any 
he, he was going to stand up for his work and be strong for what for what he, he, he uh, believed in for those characters in series four. Um, Captain, thank you so much. Susan Bauer brought you in, oh. though, right? Susan Bauer is the one that found that brought you in originally. Yeah, I think she called my agency to see if anyone wanted to do any scripts for a place to call home, and um, I had just come off two very big movies that were controversial and involved a lot of legal business, and one involved criminal, criminal danger, and the idea of doing something that was made up. <laughs> I just went yes. I said, you mean this is, I'm not going to have, you know, I'm not going to have legal action and there's not going to be criminals trying to kill me on the street. Yes, please, I'll do this. Thank you. And so that's how I, and I knew Susan from way back. And, um, yeah. I mean, did she pick you, did she pick you because of the your political theater? I've, I've been reading, I was reading Power Plays. Oh, my goodness me. <laughs> and so I was reading about your, your plays. Uh-huh. And, uh, <laughs> In America, I got it from Amazon. Yeah. All oh, right. When I heard that you were going to do a chat, I looked on IMDb and researched, and so I was reading Power Plays. Um, wow. Yeah, and uh, and the um, Hillary Glow is the author, but the way she was writing about you, you just sounded so perfect for this show. In with right. background in in. In the plays that you've done, and the fact that Noni did navigating, that would be cool. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, Noni uh, There's a line. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a line you know, that's intro where um, she says, "In this time of political tension," she's quoting David Hare, I believe. In this time of political tension, and in the context of dramatically dichotomous political views, theater seemed extraordinarily important. Well, that sounds exactly like what this show is doing right now. Well, that's right, and you know um, the you know I know we've talked about you know the the Jewish aspect of the show, obviously the homosexuality, you know the, those issues very important, and you know all I became very uh, um, interested in in the in the communism, you know the anti-communism of, of the period, you know which <laughs> obviously that you know Regina uses against Sarah. Um, none of these things have gone away. Right, and, and you, you you touched on the Aboriginal topic, which now you're going to bring back in season five, and you did, uh, I heard that, isn't that right? You're going to have an Aboriginal character, perhaps, mm, so which it. might, your yeah. work, which, uh, which play was that? Wonderland. Oh, I had written a play, Wonderland, yes. Yeah, right. Wonderland, yes. You, so, you know, you've done so much and read so much that it's all really useful. Oh, I think okay. it's age more than intelligence and interest. Anyway, but I appreciate what you're saying. No, I do have, I do believe, um, it, you know, there's no point in writing unless it has some political use, I believe. Yeah. Catherine, I just have to tell you that you have inspired me because I just started a new novel and it's set in the 50s. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's cool. In America. In, a, in, yeah. in America during the height of the McCarthy years. The height of the McCarthy period, yeah. I, I mean, I, I have been writing a, a film for 100 years. It's set in the 30s, um, which begins, you know, that's really the beginning of the Maca of McCarthy. Yeah, then, the communists, know, that's when the Communist the Party is mm. in this country. Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and it certainly wasn't illegal to be a communist. But, no, uh, it was cool. Yeah, and the fear, the fear that, um, uh, well, we won't get into politics, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting and relevant uh, topic to even be considering socialism at this time. I would, I would... Yes, it is. <laughs> Catherine, Catherine, what are you reading? Um, you know, normally if someone asks me that, because I read on Kindle, and you know, you know how you don't see the cover <laughs> until you finish the book again. But luckily for me, I can see the cover of what I have just been reading, and uh, it's called. Um, it was a book uh, called um, "The Sympathizer" by Viet Thanh Nhung, Nhung and uh, it's uh, set uh, post um, right at the end of uh, the Vietnam War. 
uh, oh, about oh. a double agent who return who who is evacuated who is Viet Cong a uh, double agent in the south and is evacuated to America yeah so Don it's, any it's last questions surprise so and I'm currently reading sorry I just I add I, um, I'm reading Bevan and I are reading um not together um uh, reading uh the um um Riviera set uh, which is a history of of, of, a, of Maxine Elliott and a house in the Riviera in the 90s, starting in about uh, post pre World War One, heading through to the 50s. Wow, Donna, you got a last question for Catherine? So I I was I hear or see echoes of Daniel Deronda and uh, Howard's End in in a place to call home. Have those novels ever been mentioned by Bevan in your discussions with him? Um, I don't recall. I, I don't know that I don't, um, I'm not as well read as Bevan. No, uh, he talks about Trollope a fair bit. Mm. Uh, look, I, I'll write that down. Um, yeah, Howard's End. I read Howard's End years ago. No, look, not, not, but you, you know, I, I would be surprised if, if, if all of those are running around Bevan's, Bevan's head at any given time. Um, Catherine, we, we don't really, we don't want any spoilers because we don't want anything ruined for us. But can you, um, before we let you go, can you just give us um, just a little sense of the mood, perhaps, that we might see in season five? Ah, you know, I'm not, I'm not kidding you, but because we're still at, we just still have scripts on paper, you know, and we, we don't really, um, well, now I am fibbing. Yeah, look, we, we do have a strong sense of, 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 of the mood of the series, but I really can't give that away without telling more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, um, Bevan did... If, yeah, what did Bevan say? Uh, well, um, I, I, I don't want to, I'm going to paraphrase, but he did tell me that it would be the most Jewish season. And he said that it would be a very emotional, uh, you know, a very emotional um, a, a season. Um, I think that's what's really driving us at the moment um, is, is that it's, it is driven, it's driven by emotion. And that is the um, that's why we're, we're at the moment we're molding the scripts to make sure that we're turning the gas up when it's needed. And uh, you know, you were talking. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, but you know, we were talking before about uh, when there's in pace. You know, so making sure that that the emotional um, emotional drive is there when we need it, and then letting people done gently and then turning it up again. Yep. So so driven by emotion I think would be a good way is a good way to put it. I, I have a very quick question before you go. Who does your research? Both both the, not just costumes but the times and and um, the culture and even the politics of the time. Mm. Uh, oh we um uh Last, uh, it had been me um, this year uh, I, for series five. I had um, I had an assistant, uh, you know, who was typing, who who was the note taker in the meetings. And when we had some time, I'd quickly throw things at him. So we 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 came, we began with a good bank of of, of research, um, not just off the internet, obviously. Um, and we've got the Sydney Morning Herald archives, which are terrific. So, you know, you know when you're an episode, and I try to get in the hat, I've forgotten. Um, but you know, if you just go to the paper on that day, and you start to feel like you're back in that in that time, um, it's interesting. So, so, so we we do that, and, and you know, the writers do their own and come racing, you know, you know, and, and are excited by things. Um, uh, Yep. Yeah, so, so we all—it's—it's it's a mixture. There's nothing terribly um, set in stone, and we just—it's all kept on Dropbox, and everyone has access to it. But um, I mean, one interesting example was in series four when Sarah's having the baby, and um, I 
began because it was my episode and I, I, I needed someone who remembered the practices of, of childbirth. Well, there aren't too many people who remember who doctors, you know, because they would be now um, uh, 50, 70, or 50, 60, you know, they'd be in their 70s, you know, there aren't a lot around. So um, we did find a midwife who had known someone who could tell us those things. Um, so a particular kind of onset research. And, um, and for that episode, I sat down on the set during all of the birth just to make sure, just in case there was something that, you know, needed adjusting really quickly. Um, so I just sat outside the, the labour ward. <laughs> Catherine, what, one, one last uh, um, uh, a, a question for you. Um, you know, um, a place to call home, uh, while uh, it might be called an Australian drama, um, it has captured the imagination of people all over the world. Um, there are people watching it all over America, all over Europe, um, you know, in countries I never heard of. Um, why? What do you think is so universal about this program? Yeah, it's a bit of it's a surprise, isn't it? Um, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a delicious surprise. I think um, any it, the, it, the period in which it's set, just in terms of of of, of the period as a character. Is, is a time of, of great change. Um, we're on the cusp of, of class, of people, um, even though in Australia, you know, we, you hear people say it's a classless society, um, we know that's not true. Um, so, so class is very important and that's a universally understood um, 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 concept and it creates tension and it creates drama. How are people going to overcome their class? I mean, you mentioned Harry, um, perfect example, but Sarah and the Blyes, the Blyes themselves, um, their obstacles are, are universal, I think. Um, um, a family eroding, you know, in, in the early series, you know, uh, the son who's homosexual, who's, you know, likely to drag the entire family into the, you know, into into the gutter and, and um all of it. I think the the personal stories are well calibrated, um, and they're surprising. So unlike a uh, you know a soap opera where you can usually say the lines out loud, you know, <laughs> or often can. With this, there's always um, and this is Bevan's skill again, um, and then um, yeah. And Bevan School and the writer's skills is is that there, there there are twists there are interesting twists I think when you talked about Livia earlier not where you expected her to go yeah um, but true to the period for instance giving up your child um, I mean we talked about that a lot that in that time women gave up their children if they wanted to to go off that's that's how it worked um, so finding things that are true to the time, that are surprising. I think all of that is, I hope, contributes to something that people can relate to. I don't know. What what does everyone else think? I think it touches, I think what you say is true. Um, I think it, uh, because of the issues, homosexuality, anti-Semitism, classism, uh, uh, for veterans, I think it touches on, it takes place in the 50s, but it touches on issues that are very much a part of day, -to -day living now. And I think it challenges us to, um, you know, look at ourselves, look at where we come from, and to, um, uh, it, it just challenges us to look at ourselves. Um, some of the conversations on, on, in our group, uh, where I remember when we started the group a year and a half ago, and there were people who said they, you know, didn't really know any Jews or people who'd been through the Holocaust. And then there were parents who were coming forward and told us about, uh, I've never told this story before, but uh, I have a gay son and, you know, sharing their stories. And, um, you know, the veterans, although it's kind of been a small part, 
um, it, 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 touched, it touched people tremendously. So I think it shows that um, how far we've come, but that we really haven't come that far at all. Well, I mean, I think the core to it um, um, really is, you know, it goes back to the title, doesn't it? What does it mean to be home? Is it home in your heart? Is it a physical place? Um, God knows the full of people at the moment who don't have one, um, and uh, I think I think that's important too. Is is um, when when will these characters know that they've come home, if you like? Now, ho hopefully not for a very long time, because that's the role of a dramatist to stop them from getting what they want. Um, that's our job, is to keep putting up the roadblocks. But um, uh, that that quest to find a, a sense of personal peace and love, I think, is, is within all those characters. Hopefully the journey will be a very long one. For, or I don't mean long. I mean the, 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 the gulf between what they want and how they and the journey they're going to take will be a, a nice, wide and difficult one. Um, and I think but, that, that should be universal. To pick up on uh, something Susan said, I think, perhaps because we all recognize that we're living now in a time of tremendous change and transition, that to look back at a time uh, of transition when uh, you can see, because we're, we're looking back at it, you, you can see that things changed and changed dramatically and the world didn't fall apart. It gives you yes. a little more confidence um, um, what you're living through now. Uh, to your point on how do you know when you're home, I thought that uh, so, something I learned uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago when the Israelis announced the, four, the fourth season, I saw the ad on uh, the Facebook page and they didn't translate a place to call home in a very literal sense. They translated it, and someone who understood the program, I think, translated it as uh, uh, the place that can go into your heart. And the word for place that is used is also the word, uh, is also has this these connotations of being sacred. It's another word sometimes that's a substitute for God in Hebrew. So right. it's got multiple meanings in the Hebrew text that I think really gets out um, the richness and the layers of, of the program itself. Yes, no, that's interesting. Yeah, well, hopefully those things are what, you know, what appeals to people. Yeah, I think you're right about that sense of, of coping with change. Um, and yeah, there is something, to, yes, there is something reassuring that, yes, that, if their world won't fall apart, perhaps ours won't either. Um, now, Catherine, people I'm, now look back at, and, at and, the homosexual issue and, and I think say, oh my God, you know, at, at that point it was illegal. James could have been uh, uh, jailed uh, as other people were. Uh, people are beaten up, how, how, how wrong, but also how, how dumb it was. There's nothing to be afraid of. Yes, that's right. That's right. And that, that you get that, from, as you say, from that historical perspective. Thank you. How dumb it was, yes. Um, Catherine, I want to thank you so, so much for taking time. You've given yes, us some thank you. real insight. I think that uh, when uh, David posts this conversation on the page, that there'll be lots of comments. And um, you've given us some real insight into uh, how it all comes together but um you know sharing yourself with us i think we have a better uh, understanding of uh how it all uh you know who these people are and now that we know uh a bit more about uh who creates this um it's going to be great for everyone well so, and, um, and can i just stress you know the, the the team effort that goes on um that um you know nothing is an accident you know that that I mean, as you know from Women He's Undressed now, the, the, my documentary, you know, wardrobe, um, costume department will, will come rushing out and say, look at this 
dress I've just found for Regina, you know, and look at this this dress. And so you immediately go, oh, my God, that's inspiring me to write the next draft of the script, you know. There's a lovely um, symbiosis that goes on uh, in, 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 in the production that... Um, so, so while we've highlighted the script writing section today, which often gets neglected, um, we mustn't, <laughs> mustn't acknowledge everyone else. Otherwise, they'll kill me. <laughs> oh, well, we talked so much about the clothes, and you should know that there are women, there are women all over Australia who are now dressing in clothes uh, uh, from the 50s as a result of, and they're not just, they're wearing them in their everyday life and they're having meetings and they're coming to brunch and they're planning a big dinner dance where uh, everybody is, you know, they have their own page where they talk about the fashion that they're going to wear to this dinner dance. So, um, and we talk at length about the music and the cars. And um, so, you know. Right. Uh, okay. We, That's good. good. We're, we're real fans. We're real, real fans. Um, again, I, I want to thank you, Catherine. Um, well, very you did, much. That was really, really, really enjoyable. And um, I hope I painted the picture that you you were after. And um, after season five, we'll ask you to come back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Could I, um, could I just say something before we go? Sh please. Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, just to explain, just to explain. I know that um, conflict is the essence of drama. And I probably didn't explain myself terribly well before, but I think just my feeling in season three was that there was a lot of a lot of things going wrong and not a lot of things going right. Not a lot of nice yeah. things to be happy about. I just wanted to feel yeah. a bit happy and uplifted some of the time more than I did. Yeah, no, yeah. no, that's a really no. I, I wrote I wrote that down actually because I really I'm going to think about that because I no I did understand what you mean, yeah. but it's good to clarify. Um, no, but you're right, Abs absolutely, and um, and uh, who know? Yeah. Anyway, that and that was it, series three. And I know, know that oh. we need the conflict in it, and it, it's um, yeah, it's part of it. Mm, so, but no, no, no. I take I take your point on that, and and it, it actually I can it can it can often happen that you you, you can start to neglect that kind of uh, those elements. So um. Yes, all right. It, it had a, I thought I it had a bit of a change of direction because of, of you know, the people being going on to Foxtel. So, no, no. Um, um, you know, and, no, and Bevan leaving. Bevan. And, uh, so and uh, I wasn't surprised, but I was just a bit disappointed. Yeah, but you've seen Series 4? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still going. Yes, We're still going. It's just that oh. um, I wasn't happy with um, Season 3 and... Because of uh, because of it was a bit depressing. A, a yes, bit depressing okay. About what happened. And, all um, right. But you've have you watched all season four, or have you had all these? Watched every episode ever. Oh, good. Okay, I didn't want to spoil everything. No, no. I uh, and and do you think that there were more happier? Like, did characters get their happier moments in season four? Um. Yeah, I think that there was not so many terrible things that happened to the ones that we lo love and care about. Right, um, okay. I suppose one of the things, if I could go back to Olivia for a minute, is that um, I didn't like the artist. I was very glad we got rid of him. Very happy. <laughs> so now we've got two Richard to get rid of. He's a, good, he's a good one to He's a good one to keep going, I'm sure, for drama's sake. But exactly. If, if, if she had yeah. fallen in love with somebody... If she, you know, she was a person who was vulnerable and needing somebody to love, somebody to love. and if she had found somebody who was worthy of her love, I would have been happy. But I didn't like him. I thought he was a creep, and I wasn't the only one. <laughs> anyway, I better not hold us up any longer. Thank you very much, Catherine. One more point before we say goodbye. Um, Thank you. We love the secondary character. I, I don't want to say secondary, but the ones who are, um, we love Roy Briggs. We love Doris Collins. We we um, miss the uh, Paletti family and um, the Goldberg family. And, you know, I understand, you know, Bevan, you know, explained to us about, uh, first of all, budget, budget, budget. Um, but um, we so appreciate how much, they contribute to the overall essence of the program, and we certainly hope to see um, 
and get to know a little. I'd like to know a little bit more about Doris. Maybe you know, I understand that she's you know has her her uh, role to play, but I would just like to know just a little bit more about her and a little bit more about uh, about Roy. But they're all spectacular. Okay. And uh, on behalf of the almost fifteen hundred members of our of our group, I want to thank you for not just spending time with us, but for delivering so much um, joy and excitement to all of us. Oh, well, thank you. No, it, it really, um, it inspires us. Uh, I must say. And uh, it, it, when I was first told about this group, I, 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 I don't think I had uh, ever worked on a show that had such a, a fan base like this. So, um, I felt very chuffed and even more so now to, to have been invited along. So thank you. And uh, wherever you are, have a nice evening. It must be late, you guys. So uh, sleep well. It, okay. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Oh. Oh. All right. Thank you, Susan.